Um, all right, so welcome everybody. I'm sure there'll be a few more people joining us. There was quite a few more people registered. I know there's been a couple of people who've mentioned to me that they're not going to make it this afternoon, but they are keen to see the recording. So we are recording it and we will make the recording available afterwards. Um, I know some of you here were at the event on the 30th and 31st of July and some of you weren't. So what I really wanted to do was try and just pull out some of the key learnings and the, and the key themes. And the form of this, uh, this, this session today I'd really like it to take is a discussion really. I mean, I'll start off with sharing a few of my thoughts, but more importantly, I'm, I'm keen to hear from all of you that, that were there. What were your key learnings and your and your key takeouts uh, of of the session? I should introduce myself. Uh, I think I think I knew everybody that was here at the start. But I'm Louise Gardner. I'm the founder and managing director of Pledge Group. Um, and yeah, we hosted the event uh, PMTS Project Management Technology Showcase on the 31st, uh, the 30th and 31st of July. So two weeks ago now. It's gone gone quick, hey? Mm -hmm. Um. All right. So. Um, not going to get super structured. If you have a question, if you have a comment, jump in, um, use the chat or yeah, don't hesitate to, to jump in. It's, it's really a forum for an exchange of thoughts and ideas. Um, all right, so uh, set some context. We were at the Hilton Hotel in Sydney, a uh, great venue. They did a great job. We had about 180 delegates, um, 32 speakers and panelists and 10 technology sponsors. And those technology sponsors really represented the, the leading names in PPM technology. Um, we had some people who were more at the strategic end. We had your traditional PPM uh, technology and we had a, a vendor or two that was uh, more in the portfolio management space. But a lot of the people who were there were, were people you recognize, the, the, um, the household names and, and the leading PPM tools. And one of the reasons we thought this would be a good event to run is because each one of these technology vendors, and, and in fact all technology vendors, are starting to incorporate emerging technologies like AI. And we were really keen to understand what that's going to do to our tools. Uh, and so we were delighted when more than 180 people were also keen to keen to find out the answers to the to the same question. So I'd say the purpose of the session is to share key learnings and, and key themes that that came out of the event. Um, discussion based session. I do have a few slides that highlight some of the issues that came out of our roundtable talks. Uh, the roundtable sessions were really focused on um, PPM implementations and sessions. So um, we did get some some notes taken down formally from those. So I'll share with you those before the end of the session, too. So if I can kick off with a with a learning of my own. I just want to highlight how delighted and a little bit surprised. I say we we launched the event, so um, we kind of knew there'd be an appetite to to see where the technology was going to take us. But I was absolutely over the moon to see how much engagement there was with the tech sponsors and, and vendors and some genuine curiosity and, and two way knowledge sharing about where's the technology going? Um, what's on the roadmaps? What will the future features be? I felt like that was a really good um, two-way session uh, of knowledge so that was that was really one of my key learnings um, and validated the the reason for the whole event actually the people wanted to know what's coming up in technology in our space and the tech vendors were delighted to share and i think that was one of the biggest kind of sources of joy for me was just that two-way knowledge exchange so i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna try and quieten down for a second now i'm gonna throw it open to to the floor i've got Marnie with me here in in newcastle and i've got some of my team in sydney as well as the the other the other people in the room so any any big learnings or or, or key themes that anyone would like to share i just wanted to point out that um with with those thirty two speakers we we met them during the year we we heard that they had implemented technology of some kind and that they had had some wins. Um, it hadn't been an easy road necessarily. They had had some challenges as well, and it made for the perfect story. So we deliberately invited the 32 speakers to come and share that story. Quite often, it had never been shared before, yeah. um, because people were fascinated in the in all the things that happened with the technology implementation, from how to even begin in the first place, whether you've got the right data, processes, people, whether what you've currently got is good enough to do the yeah. job. 
and then what it looks like, how you implement, how you evaluate, how you implement, what what are some of the quick wins, things that go wrong, and what to do when you have gone wrong, all the way through to what ROI looks like two years after buying the software. So um, yeah, that was uh, one of the most popular things was the fact that almost every presentation was about something that had happened rather than theoretical. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think the tech sponsors kept on in that theme as well, really sharing mm. case studies. Um, while people are having a think about what, what resonated with them, let's touch on um, the thing that most people were really excited about, and that was the discussion around AI. Um, who, who saw the panel discussion and AI? Were there any key learnings there? Were there any surprises? Um, we've done a few panel discussions on AI over the last 18 months. And what I'm finding is every time we talk about it, it's a slightly different discussion. It never, it, It's never the same discussion twice. You know, you, you can have the conversation six months apart and it's all, all always throwing up um, new insights. Any any thoughts around that? Was that panel discussion, did that, did that highlight what you were expecting to see or something different? I think I heard a, a few times Louise on the subject of AI that it's early days and we quite don't quite know how it's all going to play out but mm. it, it seems like it's going to be beneficial uh, with with an asterisk against it with a note of caution because of some of the biases that AI may provide mm. uh, in answering the questions that are provided to it. Yeah agree agree Pete. One of the things that is on very much on my radar at the moment around AI is the fact that some organisations are being prevented from using it, just full stop, um, because the rules, the protocols, the governance isn't <clears> yet in place. And I think the, the individuals in the teams and in the organisations can see some good use cases for it, but the organisations aren't quite there yet. Um, there's other organisations that... Um, can see a use case for it, but aren't quite sure of the cost benefit. So there's some comments made on the panel discussion about it's quite expensive to implement. There's a willingness to implement it, but there needs to be a tangible benefit. And they're not sure where that's coming from. I think it was another good kind of stream of, of conversation that I think came up on the panel discussion. Is anybody using AI? Anybody on the on the webinar this afternoon? Is anybody using AI uh, on their projects at this point? Because it was really something that people wanted to talk about and hear more about. And uh, I think one of the observations just reinforces what Peter has said in terms of AI is throwing back at us our own biases. Yeah. So that's very important in terms of the information. The other thing is, as you stated, organizations aren't using it because of the security aspect. Mm. There's no IP anymore. Once you have the information out there, you don't know what it's going to be used for mm. and who's going to use it yeah, exactly until right. when it's going to be stored. And that's the challenge, especially if you work for the federal government, for defense, for ASIO, all of these um, entities. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not just important to highlight. It's not just those organisations that are tentative. It's some of the you know organisations that are t typically less conservative, more progressive. Um, there's just a real desire to um, make sure that data is safe. So data management was a was a key thing. Data management, data security was a real key theme that came out of the AI, AI conversation, along with more general kind of project governance type of types of concerns. Let's um let's think about the uh, the other panel discussion that happened, which was also really interesting. On on day two, we had a panel discussion on um the role of spot uh, role of technology in project sponsorship. Uh, and we had three fairly senior uh, executives, PMO executives uh, and a actually a CTO on the panel. And so there was quite some quite robust conversation around the use of technology and whether technology really had a role in, in sponsorship. And I think the underlying feeling was that it did have a role, but it was to facilitate rather than to 
uh, and to support rather than to to be an end uh, in itself. Um, and I think broadly everybody agreed with that. One of the conversations there that sticks in my mind was the the, the C CTO on the panel, Tom Tom Gao, was kind of sandwiched, and, and we had a little bit of a joke at the time. If anyone remembers, that he was kind of the meat in the sandwich, um, and he was you know very typical CTO um, saying, "I don't want things to be red." I want things to be green. And, you know, the role of technology is really to, as far as I'm concerned, is to support the teams to make things go green. And then we had the, the PMO leaders, uh, Rian and, and Daniela, really explaining that they thought the role of technology was to, to help highlight that things were red and to show why they were red. And, and there was a real kind of conflict between the, the two conversations, which was good natured, but really mirrored what happens every day in organizations it's the cto or whomever is the, you know the, the at the top of that particular tree saying why are, why haven't we done this why is it late um why is it cost too much and um you know with varying degrees pmo leaders or project managers saying well these are the hoops we've got to jump through uh, and so it was quite an illuminating discussion i thought um, it was a good way to round out the day actually it was quite an entertaining uh, presentation of, apart from apart from anything else I might um, I might then uh, move into some of the findings from the roundtables. Um, feel free to jump in on this one, Dave. I know you um, were, were very close to, to these, and Amani, you were too, actually. You were facilitating some of these conversations as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what we what we did is we had a couple of scribes. We had two roundtable sessions, and we had some scribes in each room. And what we asked them to do was summarize the conversations that happened. So um, we asked people uh, some, some curated questions and we've kind of summarized the key themes from that whole hour of conversation because there were key themes that came out of those conversations. So one of the, the key things was um, whatever tool you use, whatever technology that you are invested in, organizations must ensure that processes are aligned with both the capabilities and the objectives of the tools. And this involves always involves a, a balance between standardization and customization. Um, and it should consider different objectives from from around the business. And this is a very strong principle for us because we always advocate for, for processes before tools. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes organizations jump in and, and they want a particular tool for a particular reason. But it usually is much more straightforward if you have your processes established before you go down the tools route. And this was really validated for us, actually, um, through some of these conversations. Anybody have a part of these conversations? Would you like to, to share any thoughts or findings with us? This was also reinforced in a uh, number of speakers' presentations. Yes, yeah. In terms of processes and the foundation to be there before you go evaluating the tool and selecting the tool. So there was, I think you're, you're, you spoke on this as well, I think, Kamani, didn't you? It was one of your, um, um, forgive me, I did, I did miss some of your presentations. <laughs> um, one of the foundational parts is making sure processes are established before you go down the road of tool section, am I, am I understanding that yeah. right? Because then the foundations are well defined and understood. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Dave, were you? Was it you that was going to say something? I just remember listening into one of the tables talking about this at the event and uh, how it was really worked out very well that um, some of the people were just about to go through that looking at processes, but somebody somebody else at the table had just implemented the tool, and so they were able to share what what they did, um, almost like a, this is what your future looks like to the person across the table. Which yeah, always... that was good. And they probably connected afterwards, didn't they? And that was another mm. key thing that I loved across the two days. People mm. meeting each other and taking their details and saying, oh, we've just done this. Um, yeah. Let's connect offline or let's talk later, which was or let's have a drink later on. I think there was lots of new kind of professional connections made, which, again, is one of the underlying reasons that we, we try to do these events. And one of the reasons why those these roundtables are so popular as a session, where as far as the survey afterwards, the um, all the responses we got in the survey, scoring it very highly this session. Yeah. It was actually the number one scoring session, I think, and it, and it often is because mm. um, people get to sit and just talk about what they're going through and learn from 
the other key people around the table. So yeah, it was a it was a good one. I I agree. That explains why, despite having lunch time immediately after, most of them. Yeah, they didn't yes. leave. They did. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they wanted another question. So at <laughs> in time, are you happy to take on another question? And they say, everyone said yes. That was really great. <laughs> yeah, that's a sign of a good session when yes. people don't want to go to lunch. It's something that we do at the uh, symposium as well when we do a lot of our interactives are then uh, there's a, a break afterwards so the conversations can continue. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. Um, I'll go to the next one. So our old favourite change management. Um, of course, it was felt that change management absolutely critical for the successful implementation of not only PPM tools, but of course, everything that, that we do in organisations, um, including dedicated change resource, creating a change management plan, making sure that there's alignment between corporate strategy um, and having really solid comms training and stakeholder engagement in place. And again, this was um, universally agreed, I think. Was, was this a feature of your presentation as well? It was a feature <laughs> of every speaker's presentation in terms of change management involving stakeholders taking small steps in terms of how a phased approach in terms of the tool. Yep. That's a good point. Actually, I heard the term crawl, walk, run come up a few times. Mm. So um, yeah. no big bangs, multi-phased approach, making sure people are very clear on their role um, and making sure the role of, of all stakeholders was, was clearly understood. Um, it's interesting. We um, obviously as a business are, are across many PPM implementations over the last few years. And where they're not adopted as readily as they might be, it's often because of change management or change management stroke, stroke training. Uh, there's a lot of effort around gathering requirements about tool functionality. Um, all of those things are important, of course. Um, but if that change management piece isn't done well, even the best educated, best um, executed project may not succeed which is by the time you get to the end is is sad if it's if that's the bit that lets it down it really can be unfortunate metrics and measurements again this came up so often you know having an idea of what success looks like before you go down the rule of even before you go down the road of procurement and selection having a, a key idea of what are you trying to achieve very very important so not only identifying what those metrics would be, should be, but tracking them, tracking them through the life cycle of the project, asking them, um, asking at certain points through the delivery life cycle, are we still going to do this? It's like, it's almost like benefits tracking. It's exactly what it is actually. Excuse this me. is what we set out to achieve. How are we going? And if we're not going as we planned, are we still gonna get the value that we expected? So very, very similar process to how you track any, any benefit understanding what those set outcomes should be, understanding um, what data you're looking to collect and, and report and addressing issues along the way that could slow down that, that project um, through the use of metrics. Um, again, there's a clear difference between organisations that have these metrics and organisations that don't think about metrics to the end. Because um, most organisations will always come back to metrics at some stage. It's the nature of the business we're in. But being proactive about that and having clear objectives and metrics at the beginning um, really can be a, a, a key success factor a, as well. And understanding how these metrics will be measured consistently across the board. That's yeah, important. yeah. I think the other part, I think I heard this spoke about as well, is that you put in a tool and you are trying to solve a problem at a specific point in time. But of course, business problems ebb and flow. And the way you have procured and designed and built a tool might be fit for fit for purpose on day one, but 12 or 18 months down the line, the business needs might have changed. And so being able to have something solid to point to and say, you know, we achieved these metrics, but now the metrics should be this, rather than just saying the tool doesn't meet the need anymore, or this is no good, or um, having a clear benchmark of, this is why we got this tool, this is what it's meant to do, um, can make things much, much easier. One of the other complicating factors here is, again, it comes down to the ebb and flow of organisational change. People move on. If these metrics and measure measurements and benchmarks aren't documented, 
when that that team turns over the purpose of the tool can be lost if it's not documented so really really important not just to have it in your head or with one person but to have that as a, 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 a plan that you can revisit and assess its fit for purposeness or not on, on a regular business on a regular basis as the business changes so yeah good point Amani. Um, I talked a little bit about this in, in my presentation. I spoke um, about the importance of requirements gathering um, to successful PPM implementation. So it's really good to see it come out in the roundtable talks as well. It validates that not not just not a problem that I've seen. It's something that many organizations struggle with. Um, and there's a real debate on the extent to which PPM tools should be customized to fit business processes or keeping them out of the box in line with what the tool does natively to make sure it's simple and, and aligns with the, the software development practices and the roadmaps that are going to come out and update these products. And I think, that, you know, the conversation, uh, there's no one answer to this. It really depends on, on your business and, and the complexity and the maturity of the business. I think um, in, in my case study that I presented, um, I really highlighted a bit of an extreme example, admittedly, where every customization was agreed to initially. And then when it became clear that it was the system was kind of Frankenstein, it, it was no longer actually meeting its core needs. Then it was really stripped back and went to the other extreme and business processes were revised downwards. And the decision was taken, actually, we're only going to implement this if we can do it out of the box. And I think um, the organizations that do this well go as out of the box as they can, but accepting that there'll always need to be not necessarily customization, but at least a good degree of configuration um, enabled to be able to tailor the tool to your specific business processes. I don't think I've ever seen a PPM tool that you can plug and play. Every business is different. Every department within every business is different. So there'll, there'll always be a need for configuration and to some degree some customization. Gordon, have you got any thoughts on this? Yeah, actually I I completely agree with uh, what Louise uh, is saying. So sometimes uh, look, uh, I've implemented PPM uh, tools for so many organizations and one of the biggest advice I give them is to try and and stick as natively to the configuration process. Uh, customization to be used and exceptionally uh, if there's a customization requirement uh, whether the process can be followed you know potentially in parallel uh, is an option um, one of the biggest considerations to businesses when they customize a ppm tool as louise was saying requirements change you know ebb and flow tomorrow your process needs to change then your your tool to make it fit becomes a bit of a challenge here yeah. So Would you ever push back, Gordon? Have you ever seen a scenario where you think the degree of customization is too much and you would suggest that perhaps that's not the not the way to go? Yeah, I, I, I push back. I basically question in terms of uh, unless as the, the organizations basically have been following that process uh, for a while. So it's kind of more or less cemented as part of the operations of the organization. Otherwise, I constantly push back uh, because customizations are hard for organizations to maintain. Mm. Um, you know, today you build something, it's for today uh, and tomorrow it's, as you mentioned, you know, things can change and then to to reconfigure is not an option because it's customized mm. and uh, customizations can also be expensive as well. So I do, yeah, absolutely, I push back. Um, that's one. The second thing that I push back on is that Customization is fine. How are you? How is the organization going to support the the PPM tool? Do they have the in-house skills, or you know, do they have some sort of support mechanism uh, to support it to cater to those ebbs and flows as the process or the organization changes as well? So, absolutely, yeah. Louise. Yeah. Have you got any thoughts generally? I know I know every organization is different, but have you got any views on what good looks like in terms of support? For, for new tools? Yeah, I think what good looks like is uh, one is to map uh, your process. So first, basically, as you rightly said, 
organizations sometimes start with the tool, thinking the tool will will sort all the problems out uh, and then work on the process. I would say basically start with uh, what the organization is looking to achieve, uh, largely from a, a monitoring, reporting, the metrics you talked about, right, in terms of metrics around project controls to start with that. Second is start with a process that the organization can support. So many times I walk into an organization, they put this elaborate process in place, but they don't have the governance or the people to support it. So they put this big resource management process in place, but there's nobody there's nobody to, yeah. to support that process. So that's the, the, the one. So put whatever you're putting in place, make sure the support mechanisms are in place from a process perspective. Uh, and then look at the support from a tool perspective. So support and look at Louise on both sides, the tool and the process as well. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. I think something that we see quite often is the thought that the tool will be the magic bullet mm. in and of itself. This will solve all of our problems um, and no tool will ever do that. We'll do that. Uh, it'll always help, <laughs> but in and of itself, it's uh, yeah. it, it's going to. If you don't have some of those things that Gordon was talking about, you know, resources, processes, it will just expose the gaps rather than yeah. build them. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gordon. So the next topic that came up um, frequently was around continuous improvement and scalability. Um, really the need to, to keep learning from not just best practices, from, but from your own improvements. Um, making sure that your tools can be improved and can be scalable as you and your team get more mature and better. One of the reasons that many teams go down the road of tool implementation is because they've reached a certain level of maturity and then they want to get to the next level of maturity. And that doesn't stop. You want to get to the next level of maturity again and to keep growing and, and learning from that, then uh, those continuous improvement mechanisms have to be in place. Um, lessons learned, workshops and, and sessions, obviously a key mechanism for that. Um, and why we see, you know, as project managers and PMO people, we are often the first to say, let's have a lessons learned workshop. But we probably don't do it often enough or well enough around how we've implemented our own processes and tools. And so I think when we get to a point of maturity and that might be recognised through a, a P3M3 type review, or it might just be recognised by, you know, we're just doing much, much better. It could be informal. Um, it's always good to have a, a review of how did we get here? What have we done? What do we need to do next? And how does that impact what we want from our, our systems? Um, and I think that's, I say, we, we shouldn't, we should be good. We all should be good at this as project professionals, but sometimes it is a, a gap, I think. And there was a lot of conversation around, how we need to do that, how we build in those continuous feedback and improvement loops. I think anyone who's spoken said that they uh, were happy with their PPM tool, um, were very popular for the rest of the two days, <laughs> and were kind of <laughs> followed around by a little entourage of uh, people. Uh, so yes, it was, uh, that was interesting to see. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. There was a few people I heard give an example saying things like, well, we've implemented X product and these are results we were getting. And yeah, they were like rock stars. Um, tell, <laughs> us how, tell us how you did that. Um, have you yeah. got time for a chat next week coming back to those connections again? So, yeah, th that was really lovely to see people learning from each other and such a such a hunger. to. Uh, that's what we're trying to do now. So can you can you please share? Mm. Um, so, yeah, that that was really good. Um, let's move on to the next one. Um, training and adoption. Um, again, moving on from just the, the kind of planned change management, um, having change champions and experts and people who, you know, sometimes you'll you'll send them on the train the trainer course, but regardless of whether whether they've been through something like that, they're real advocates for the new way of working. And that is absolutely essential for making sure that these tools are used. You know, again, one of the things that we see too often is that organizations have invested in a new tool. Um, they've trained people, they've got the requirements bang on, but people start working around it because I uh, kind of like the way I used to do it. Or, you know, someone said they've got a great spreadsheet. And so having that buy in from those key people on the ground, the change champions, 
is another real key success factor. And sometimes what, what we found doing implementations is the best people to become change champions are those people who weren't really sold on the change in the first place. If you can get to those people who were a little bit resistant and you can bring them on board and you can change change their um, feelings about it, then they will go off around the business and they will change other people's minds. And before you know where you are, you've got, you know, not just a couple of advocates for the change, but a whole army of people who are keen to to use the tools and, and get the benefits. Um, so, yeah, that I mean, that, the, the whole use of the change champion principle, we, we will do that a lot. But it's not just about picking individuals, it's it's tailored communications, dedicated comms and change resources. Again, it's it's not done often enough. Too often it stays within the PMO or the delivery teams as this is your tool and, and you manage it. Um, if you can get some organisational support around change and comms and it, it becomes more of a business project than an IT project. This was something that I spoke about in my presentation as well. When a PPM tool is seen as an IT project, it doesn't get the same traction typically is when it's seen as a business change project and you get that senior level sponsorship from right across the business. So that's often a, a good um, a good mechanism to have uh, adoption. So I guess the, the other thing to add on to that was, you know, what you do after the training. Do you have self-serve content? Do you have expert users? We see a lot of tools now that come with really great videos where people can just go in and they want to do a function. They can just go and press play. Um, I think that that element of service from from vendors is becoming more and more slick. Almost every time I see a new product, I'm blown away by the extent to which people can self-serve training content. So that, that, that's getting better and better, I think. Our presenters as well, you know, think about uh, Suncorp or Sydney Metro or what about Tony Wood at Australian Museum? You know, you'd follow the follow women to battle, wouldn't you? Uh, that's, uh, uh, I think talk about change champion, but I think he was just, um, yeah, he just said, we're going to go for this and, uh, and off they went. Yeah. And again, if you've got that kind of leadership, mm. you, can, you can move mountains. But even if you don't have that kind of leadership, if you've got good objectives, clear outcomes and a real plan, um, you can still get there, but yeah, you you would absolutely follow Tony into battle. I, lo I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't have to, but I, I would. <laughs> um, moving on, uh, another key theme, data management. So I've touched on it already, but this came up, I think, again, almost, almost every presentation, I think, had an element of data management, particularly around AI. Um, it plays such a huge role in, in um, not only optimizing PPM tools, but essentially in, in understanding what we're going to do with it at all. Again, too often I see, um, oh, we'll get a tool. And it's not just PPM tools, um, it's all tools, but p particularly PPM. We're, we're going to get this new tool, it's going to fix everything. Um, and garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't have policies around what data that goes in, what format it goes in, how we manage that data, then a tool isn't going to help you in any way whatsoever. You're just going to be replicating the same results you got without a system, but you're going to pay a lot of money to, to do it. Um, so organizations, project teams, PMOs really need to identify key data points um, and agree. Again, it's, it's a process thing prior to prior to implementing a tool. What do we need to indicate status? Uh, what do we need to capture and, and report risks? How are we going to um, define what our key planning metrics are? All of those discussions. And, and, you know, if you don't know and you go to a vendor, the vendors will often give you a really good generic response. And, it, and that may be enough to start you off. But I've never seen uh, this done out of the box. The law was be and this or oh, plus that. Oh, and we just need to change that a little bit. So having a really clear strategy around what data you need to collect, how you'll manage it, um, you know, what's mandatory, uh, what your metadata will be. All of that is essential and becomes more and more important, actually, in in some of these AI tools. If I think about, you know, what one of the things we've talked about today up here in Newcastle actually is um, what AI tools will will do um, and, and how they can be useful. And some of the good use cases that we've seen are, are around predictive analytics. Well, 
the best AI system in the world can't do good predictive analytics unless there's good data in the system. So it still comes back to us as, as humans um, to make sure that we're not just using technology to make a problem worse than actually make a, make a problem better. Um, so I think they were the they were the key topics through the round table talks. Um, I'm going to just stop sharing for a second. Uh, I've lost my yeah, uh, I've lost my cursor. I can't. Oh, here I am. Uh, just so I can see who who we've got here. I was a bit bit lonely with the share screen on. Uh, so yeah, it's nice nice to see you all. Um, so for those of you who were with us uh, on the 30th and 31st, um, is there any key topics or themes that that I haven't pulled out there that you um, heard, learned, have, have we missed or you, you disagree with? Um, I uh, unfortunately, I, it's, we had two streams and so with the best will in the world, it's impossible to be two places at once. So I, mm. I missed at least 40 percent of the sessions, but um, I was also flying around and, and caught bits of Amani and bits of Jurgen and I got my I got my own whole presentation in, but that was probably about it. Um, so yeah, other other key themes, three, three learnings, anything that uh, I've missed. Gordon, any anything from, yeah. from you? You were you were in, in a lot of the sessions, I know. Yeah, yeah. I think what one thing that was uh, it was talked about a lot um, in discussions and thing that and something that's really coming. Uh, which is becoming quite predominant as you talked about AI and predictive analysis uh, is data security. Now, what happens is with a lot of PPM tools, the data uh, traditionally is now moving away from organizations having it installed in their environments to somewhere sitting in the cloud, uh, especially when we have, you know, govern government type of organizations or uh, or compliance based organizations. Uh, so this is becoming more and more uh, very relevant and we talk about uh, business and IT and usually IT puts in all these uh, all these questions in terms of you know data data residency I think that was something that uh, that I felt is now getting uh, with this AI and stuff like that becoming a lot predominant as as a consideration for selection of tools yeah thanks Gordon great great point um, I guess my, one of my other observations was just the sheer variety of tools. Mm. Um, as I said, there was a lot of a lot of the household names, a lot of the, yeah. the, the people there who you would expect to see. Um, and it was good to spend a little bit of time just understanding, you know, what, what's different about this tool and what's on your roadmap. And of course, there was some commonality around all mm. of that, but it was really good to see um, real innovation in the space mm. and, and people thinking about solving some of our problems, making our lives easier mm. as project professionals. So that was something that was kind of heartwarming to me. And, you know, I personally, I'm, I'm going to catch up with some of those vendors again because mm. I just want to know more about those technology solutions. Um, so that was I, I very much enjoyed that that part of it. Um, Pete, any, anything from you? Any takeaways, learnings? Mm. The the main ones in my mind you kind of touched on already, like the importance of change management. I heard change management mentioned probably as much as I heard technology mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and data I heard mentioned as much as either of those as well. So, yeah, th those were just reinforcing those old truisms about the technology is important, but what makes projects work is the people and the the relationships and the communications that go on in there. Yeah, yeah, agree, mm. agree. Um, Amani? Um, something that you've mentioned even at lunchtime with Hunter Water, the suitability of the PPM to the organizational maturity. Yeah, yeah. That's very important. And uh, put it this way, you don't pick an aircraft for people who are still walking. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we have. We talked about that a day, and and we talked about that a lot over the two days, in fact, as well. So yeah, you can get whiz bang kind of spaceship type tools, or you can get actually something that just meets you where you are today, uh, and that's important to to note as well. Um, I've got a couple of other slides I'll share, but Dave, I'll give the last word to to you. Um, anything that we haven't covered or that you'd like to share with the group? I think. Um... Yeah, look, there's um, there's so much appetite for this event for, for next time as well. I think there's uh, 
we talked to a lot of people during the year and they said to us they're thinking about using technology to deliver projects better but they really had no idea what where to go and maybe a few years ago people would have said you know microsoft clarity and a couple of other vendors but there's a lot more out there uh, now and um so what was happening was they were they were asking their colleagues what have you used before and getting five different answers then they were asking peers uh, and getting another 10 company names and then doing a google search and getting 50 i found 55 i think you know when i did it and so that that was a need for uh, an event where not only could you see some of these technologies and find out how people are using them and, and who's using uh, what product for what but also why why should my organization adopt it because we are in water and we're this big and we have this size portfolio and we currently use this and we've got this budget and the execs want this and so yeah it was that was um what it was all about really it was just finding out that people had different uh requirements different technology they were currently using and we just had no idea what to do next yeah it's a good it's a good point yeah. it's a good point i will say as well the feedback has been really great about those those things we care about most those personal connections the learnings the you know the the experience as a whole i think people for the most part got a, a lot out of it and we are already planning um 2025 um so more on that um to come um last couple of things to share uh our next session it will be a sydney uh, pmo meetup in September and we're going to have our annual session in our office um, Thursday the 12th and we're going to talk PMO trends. Um, it, it's always illuminating when we start planning our trends session because we are the first thing that Dave and I will often say is has anything changed from last year and actually when we sit down and look at the data it always has changed um, yeah. so we're very much looking forward to sharing um, the top trends from from this year with the group it's face to face only it's in our office um there will be refreshments served but there are only 30 seats available so if you would like to come please book your place it's uh, the pmo trends whether we like them or not <laughs> we should yeah, have, for... we should have that as a, a subheading actually pmo trends whether you like them or not <laughs> yes. yeah like it it's nothing uh, to do with it's nothing to do with us it's what people have told us so yeah it's important. um it's a it's a data-based um uh, exercise where we um look at what we've spoken about this year with our customers look at what we've worked on and we rank them and um share them and, and talk about them a little bit um our next um bigger event is the pmo leadership symposium in sydney very excited about this one uh we'll be in the masonic center which is a which is a a great a great venue um and we have just finalized the agenda for that one and that will be going on the up on the website in the next two weeks we're just waiting for some of our speakers to get permission from the organization um tickets are available now but yeah the the agenda the full agenda isn't up yet i can share that i will be talking about uh, ai governance again it's a topic that's coming up so much and we've started to work with organizations actually to start to put the rules in place for what responsible use of AI in a project domain looks like. So I'm really excited to share that with uh, with Symposium. Just a couple of spoilers as far as the gender is concerned. Oh, We've yeah. got uh, IAG, Sydney Airport, Domain, New South Wales, SES, Endeavour Energy, and um fu uh mufg bank and genesis energy confirmed on the agenda oh genesis energy confirmed so some of this is breaking news to me how exciting <laughs> um excellent um so yeah look that will be going up asap i say we think we're just waiting on official word from some people that they can speak and yeah. then the agenda will be up on the website if you would like to join us um there is a discount code early bird 10 and you can get the link on the qr code um uh or of course uh, reach out to us that will be valid until the 31st of august thanks for joining us and we hope to see you in person soon thanks folks